Well, good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here at this conference. I would like to thank the Heartland Institute for inviting me to speak. I've had a long association with Joe Bast and the Heartland Institute, for which I'm grateful. Over the years, they've done so much good in fighting against climate alarmism, such that years from now, when the book is finally written about how this battle was won, there must be a chapter, and that chapter, uh, you know, covering the Heartland Institute and the works that they've done, and that must you know, or account for pretty much all of that book. Well, with respect to our current panel, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to both Inder and Roger speak. They have provided ample empirical evidence that fossil fuel use is intrinsically tied to human prosperity. My talk will further reinforce this reality, albeit from an alternative perspective. Who has the clicker? Here it is. The title of my talk is, the, is Direct Monetary Benefits of Rising Atmospheric CO2 on Global Food Production. As explained by our previous speakers, the modern use of fossil fuels has led to numerous real and quantifiable indirect benefits to human prosperity. But it has also led to one very important and significant direct benefit of which most policy, weight, policy makers are seemingly unaware. That benefit is the ever-increasing stimulation of global crop production by rising atmospheric CO2, which is occurring courtesy of the ongoing and ever-increasing human combustion of fossil fuels. At a fundamental level, carbon dioxide is the basis of nearly all life on Earth. It is the primary raw material or food utilized by the vast majority of plants to produce the organic matter out of which they construct their tissues, which matter subsequently become or becomes the ultimate source of food for near all, nearly all animals and humans. And, as has been demonstrated in literally thousands of laboratory and field experiments conducted on hundreds of different plant species, the more CO2 there is in the air, the better plants grow. And the better plants grow, the more food there is available to sustain the entire biosphere. In commenting on the manifold real and measurable growth enhancing water-saving, and stress-alleviating advantages that elevated atmospheric CO2 concentrations bestow upon Earth's plants, the father of modern research in this area, Dr. Sylvan H. Whitwer, wrote in 1982 that the Green Revolution has coincided with the period of recorded rapid increase in concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And it seems likely that some credit for the improved crop yields should be laid at the door of the CO2 buildup. So just how much credit should be attributed to the rising atmospheric CO2 concentration? Well, a few years ago, I conducted the first comprehensive analysis seeking to answer this very important question, publishing my findings in a report titled The Positive Externalities of Carbon Dioxide, estimating the monetary benefits of rising atmospheric CO2, CO2 concentrations on global food production. Those findings are also set to appear in a final report to the non-governmental International Panel on Climate Change uh, entitled Climate Change Reconsidered II, Benefits and Costs of Fossil Fuels, which I believe is set for release later this year. Now, in completing my analysis of the benefits of CO2 on global food production, the first step required identifying which crops currently provide the bulk of that production. Using data from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, I found that to my surprise, a mere 45 crops accounted for 95% of that production over the 50-year period 1961 to 2011, which period served as the length of my analysis given that no data were available outside that temporal window at that time. The top 45 crops accounting for 95% of total global food production are shown in this slide. Other data that were needed to conduct the analysis included annual global uh, atmospheric CO2 values since 1961, and crop-specific CO2 growth response factors. To this end, I obtained annual global CO2 data from the most recent United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, whereas crop-specific CO2 gro growth response factors, which represent the percent growth enhancement expected for a given crop for a known rise in CO2, were acquired from the online plant growth database of CO2 science. Now, I have personally built and maintained the CO2 science plant growth database for nearly two decades now, 
It is available online at www.cotscience.org for free. And this database contains the growth response of literally thousands of plant CO2 enrichment experiments conducted on hundreds of different crops grown under a variety of environmental conditions. Now, using that database, I was able to calculate a CO2-induced uh, growth response factor for each of the 45 food crops, obtaining an expected increase in crop growth per part per million rise in atmospheric CO2. Then using those factors, I was able to quantify the degree to which crop yields in any given year were enhanced by higher levels of atmospheric CO2 above the baseline value of 280 parts per million that existed prior to the Industrial Revolution and anthropogenic buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. Then completing another set of calculations, I was able to determine the percentage of total annual production and yield of each crop in each year that was due to CO2. Thereafter, I concluded my analysis by providing an estimate of the annual monetary benefit of atmospheric CO2 enrichment on global crop production since 1961. Now, the monetary values for, for each of these 45 crops examined are presented in this next slide. As shown here, the financial benefit of Earth's rising atmospheric CO2 concentration on global food production is enormous. Over the period 1961 to 2011, such benefits have amounted to at least $1 billion for each of the 45 crops examined. And for nine of the crops, the monetary increase due to CO2 over this period is well over $100 billion. The largest of these benefits is noted for rice, wheat, and grapes, which saw increases of $579 billion, $274 billion, and $270 billion, respectively. Another interesting aspect of these calculations can be seen in this next figure, which shows the annual total monetary value of the CO2 benefit for all 45 crops over the 50-year period 1961 to 2011, revealing an ever-increasing influence of carbon dioxide enrichment over time. Whereas the monetary enhancement of CO2 amounted to approximately $18.5 billion in 1961, by the end of the record, it had grown to over $140 billion annually. And in summing, the annual benefits across the entire 50-year time window, the total benefit of rising atmospheric CO2 on global food production since 1961 amounts to a whopping $3.2 trillion. Thus, in response to Dr. Sylvan Whitworth's 1982 assessment that some portion of the credit of the Green Revolution should be laid at the door of rising CO2, we can positively affirm that such is indeed the case. But what about the future? Well, future monetary benefits of rising atmospheric CO2 con concentrations on crop production can easily be estimated using a slightly different protocol. Consider the following figure, which depicts the 1961 to 2011 historic yield data for sugarcane plotted as the solid blue line. The solid green line represents that portion of each year's annual yield due to rising carbon dioxide as per the calculations I described previously. By subtracting the green line from the blue line, we end up with the solid red line, which yield values represent the net effect of everything else that tended to influence crop yield over that time window. Although many factors likely play a role in determining the rising magnitude of this latter effect, I like to call it the techno-intel effect, as it derives primarily from continuing advancements in agricultural technology and scientific research that expand our knowledge or intelligence base. And incidentally, I should point out that although I am not including the techno-intel effect as a CO2 benefit in my study, it is clear that this effect is mostly derived through the indirect use of fossil fuels, which has enabled advances in farm machinery, fertilization, and other important improvements that have benefited crop growth and production over this period. Thus, a very strong case can actually be made that nearly all of the modern increase in agricultural production can be laid either directly or indirectly at the door of humanity's use of fossil fuels. Now, as, as mentioned a moment ago, the difference between the red techno-intel line and the observed blue line 
Above it represents the annual yield contrib contribution due to rising atmospheric CO2, which as noted by the solid green line is found to be increasing in relative influence over time. Now this fact is borne out in this next slide where the techno intel yield values are plotted as a percentage of total sugarcane yield. So whereas the influence of technology and, and intelligence accounted for approximately 96% of the observed yield values in the early 1960s, by the end of the record in 2011, it accounted for only 89%. Looking to the future, a series of mathematical procedures and statistical analyses were conducted on the data, producing annual estimates of the effects of, of technology and innovation and rising CO2 concentrations on future sugarcane crop yields ultimately producing the forecast shown here in this figure. And by repeating this process for each of the 45 crops, I was able to estimate the monetary benefits of crop production due to future increases in atmospheric CO2 through the year 2050. As seen by the green portion of this line, those result, the results of those calculations once again revealed the tremendous financial benefit Earth's rising atmospheric CO2 concentrations exert on global food production. At present, those annual benefits are rapidly approaching $200 billion. And summed over the 38-year over the period, 2012 to 2050, the anticipated benefits amount to nearly $10 trillion, which is over three times the $3.2 trillion amount calculated to, to have been observed for the much longer 50-year historic period from 1961 to 2011. So we thus have a situation where things are getting better and at a quicker pace. The economic benefits of rising atmospheric CO2 on global food production can also be expressed as an annual social benefit per ton of CO2 emitted by the combustion of fossil fuels. Now, this is accomplished by dividing the annual dollar benefit of CO2 on global food production by annual global CO2 emissions, the resultant values of which are plotted on this next slide. Here we see that the social benefit hovered around $2 per ton of CO2 emitted during the 1960s and 70s. Thereafter, it rose in linear fashion to a value of $4.81 at the end of the record, which value, I, I would note, is presently similar to U.S. government estimates of the social cost of carbon using a 5% discount rate. <laughs> now, this comparison is remarkable because it means that the economic benefits of aerial fertilization alone will offset nearly all the projected social costs forecast by the EPA's interagency working group. And by incorporating the additional CO2-induced productivity benefits realized by the timber industry, along with those experienced outside the human timber and agricultural industries, that is, the rest of plants existing and sustaining wild nature, it is likely that the CO2-induced uh, direct benefit is sufficient to completely overpower all the projected and so-called welfare damages of future climate change. Well, given such good news, it is, it is unfortunate that despite these clear and well-defined benefits, multiple members of the media, activist scientists, non-governmental organizations, and elected and appointed government officials continue to outright deny them. Rather than celebrating CO2, they pursue policies at the federal, state, and local level designed to reduce its emission into the atmosphere. Such proposed reductions, however, will not come without serious consequences. Consider, for example, the impact of reducing global CO2 emissions by 28% from 2005 levels, a percentage that was actually proposed under the Obama administration uh, during, US pres or during President Obama's tenure. In 2005, 29.7 billion tons of CO2 were globally admitted or emitted a 28% reduction would drop annual emissions to 21.4 billion tons, values last seen nearly 30 years ago in 1987. Well, returning back to our previous figure, we can see that the social benefit of carbon from increased agricultural productivity amounted to $2.91 per ton of CO2 emitted at that time, meaning the world would lose a minimum of $1.90 per ton of CO2 in benefits, or $86 billion annually, once it reverted back to 1987 emission levels and atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Well, in concluding my talk, it is clear from the material presented that the modern rise in the air CO2 content is providing a tremendous economic benefit to global crop production, 
Quoting once again from the eloquent words of Dr. Sylvan H. Whitworth, the rising level of atmospheric CO2 could be the one global natural resource that is progressively increasing food, food production and total biological output in a world of otherwise diminishing natural resources of land, water, energy, minerals, and fertilizer. It is a means of inadvertently increasing the productivity of farming systems and other photosynthetically active ecosystems. The effect effects know no boundaries in both developing and developed countries are and will be sharing equally. For the rising level of atmospheric CO2 is a universally free premium, gaining in magnitude with time on which we can all reckon for the foreseeable future. The relationship described by Dr. Whitwer is illustrated in this final slide where data pertaining to atmospheric CO2 emissions, food production, and human population are plotted. Standardized, standardized to a value of unity in 1961, each of these data sets has experienced rapid and interlinked growth over the past five decades. Rising global population has led to rising CO2 emissions, and rising CO2 emissions have benefited food production, which in turn has benefited both humanity and the biosphere. It is time for a new attitude to prevail one that properly recognizes the many important truths about carbon dioxide. For far too long now, the political climate has pursued policies at the federal, state, and local level that have besmirched and defamed the many virtues of this critically important trace, gra trace gas. Atmospheric CO2 is not a pollutant. It is the elixir of life. Thank you.